Good morning. I'm glad you can take some time this weekend to devote to worship. A few announcements before we get started. Uh, the positivity rate for this county continues to be higher than it would allow us to be in person, 28.9%. Uh, uh, in the surrounding counties, it is bouncing around about that same number. So that's the consistent uh, situation we're in right now. I continue to hope that the positivity rate will drop uh, significantly such that we can be inside in person on Christmas Eve. We'll have to see. Um, on the 21st, next Monday, we're going to have a Christmas Eve service that will be for anyone who just needs to be as safe as possible. So we'll be uh, in the parking lot, pull up, turn on your radio to the, I'll have a big sign with the, the station to tune in to, and you'll tune, in, tune into that station, and then I will run a, a service for us uh, on the 21st, this Monday at 6 o'clock, and then... On the 24th, we are going to gather in person because I'm going to sing Silent Night with some other people on Christmas Eve because that's just, it's, it, what must, it, it must happen. Now, uh, because of the positivity rate being what it is, uh, if, if it drops significantly, we'll be able to come inside. I doubt that will happen, and so we will most likely be outside around in the parking lot and I will have a, a, a fire pit that you can put on concrete without scorching the concrete and, and so I'll have that fire pit and I'll have a fire going and we will have a brief worship service outside I was looking at the weather it will be cold so please dress for the weather and uh, I will be there on the 24th with whoever uh, can join me so that's uh, our plans for Christmas Eve. There will, of course, be a video version uh, of what uh, the, is happening on the 24th that will be posted on YouTube probably on the 23rd or 24th. That's about it for announcements. I'm still not used to not saying, are there any other announcements? But I'm alone in this room. There are no other announcements. And the Lord sent Nathaniel, Nathan. Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, There were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the, one, and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks of and herds. Stop it. But the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought, and he bought it up, and it grew up with him, and with his children it used to eat of his moles whistle and drink from the, his cup and lie to, in his arms. And it was like a daughter to him. Now he there came a travel to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of the of his own flock or herd to pay all, to prepare for the guests who had come to him. But the, he took the poor man, then took the poor man's name. The Lord lives. Then, David's anger was greatly kinded against the man, and he said to Nathaniel, as the Lord lives, the man who has done the deserve, this deserve to die, and he shall restore the, okay. And he shall restore the lamb for, 
fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you out of the hand out of the hand of Saul. And I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your arms and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if this were too little, I would, ha I would add to you as much more. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and you have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Is it not working? We just want her to Today we're looking at David. David was the second king of Israel. He's the one who wove together the 12 tribes of northern and southern Israel. He is the one who created Jerusalem as the capital. He is the one who defended the borders and stabilized the kingdom. Uh, he is the person who had shown himself to be trustworthy and faithful when it came to being a, a servant of God. He was the one who, when Saul had threatened uh, David's life, uh, David had not uh, returned and, and kill, returned that and, and tried to kill Saul, even though he had multiple opportunities. And so um, David, he's just an impressive fellow, and he strikes up a friendship with uh, Saul's, the, the first king's son, Jonathan, and even when it, it becomes very hard, David is, is trustworthy and committed to his friend Jonathan. And over the course of this time, as he that leads up to him becoming king, he gathers a band of mighty men, is what they are called, the, the mighty men of David. And these are the men that are similarly committed to being trustworthy and being faithful and, and being committed to what David is doing, which is leading God's people in the way that God desires. Now, after David has the kingdom set up, after David has established and defended the borders, after David has built Jerusalem as the capital city, after David really kind of has things going on a good trajectory, David then does something that was truly unfortunate. He cuts himself off from the, his mighty men, from the people who know him and help him live up to who he is called to be, he, who help him continue to be trustworthy and honest and brave. And he cuts him, himself off for them, not because of invasion, not because he has to, he cuts himself off from them because when the season came, when the kings of, of the, the, the kingdoms went off to war, David stayed home. You see, there was a time uh, during the agricultural year of ancient uh, Israel, the, the Middle East, as we'd call it today, uh, there was this, there's this time frame in which you can, your farmers can pick up swords and, and they can go off to war. And, and you, don't have, you didn't have a standing army like we think of today. But today we think of a standing army, people who are in the military year-round. That didn't exist back then. Back then, for the most part, 
if you wanted to go to war, you had to get your farmers together and mobilize them and go fight. And that meant that you had to go when the farmers were able to leave their fields, which is a very narrow window of time. And so we're, there was this time in which all of the kingdoms knew that if you wanted to do anything, that was the time when you could get your army mobilized. And so when this time came, all the, all the kingdoms had to do that, had to mobilize their army so that they could defend their borders, or they could either go and raid another kingdom or defend against another kingdom's raids. And, and this is long before radio or any sort of telecommunication. And, and so the, the place of the king was with his army. That was the thing to do, right? There was no way to control a situation when you are multiple days away by horseback, or, or I don't know if they had horses at that point. But the point being, like, they're multiple days, hours, days away before they can find out anything. And so the king needed to be there with his army. And in David's case, there and surrounded by the people who knew him, who trusted him, who would remind him of who he's, like, who he's living up to be. Right? And he doesn't. He stays home. He stays home and by himself, alone, might be lonely, I don't know. He makes a decision. He makes a, de a decision based upon like, just his own, he, he's convinced that he's right, he makes a decision, and then another uh, person's wife ends up pregnant. This is the story of David and Bathsheba, right? Another, uh, hus another one of uh, David's mighty men, right? He, he, David uh, takes Bathsheba, and now she is pregnant, and, th and then in the cover-up, as David attempts to uh, cover up what has happened, uh, the, David's lies snowball, and, and the husband, Uriah, is killed. And so Nathan, Nathan is one of uh, David's friends. Nathan is the prophet. Nathan is the one who helps them stay focused on what God desires. Nathan has been with David for a long time and helped him get to the position that he was at, at that point. And so Nathan shows up to David, who is still continues to be alone in his capital, and he tells David this story. We read it's in 2 Samuel 12. God was not pleased with what David had done and sent Nathan to David. Nathan said to him, there were two men in the same city, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had huge flocks of sheep and herds of cattle. The poor man had nothing but one little lamb, which he had bought and raised. It grew up with him and his children as a member of the family, it ate off his plate and drank from his cup and slept in his bed. It was like a daughter to him. One day a traveler dropped in on the rich man. He was too stingy to take an animal from his own herds or flocks to make a meal for his visitor. And so the rich man took the poor man's lamb and prepared a meal to set before his guest. At this, David exploded in anger. As surely as God lives, he said to Nathan, the man who did this ought to be lynched. He must repay for the, for the lamb four times over for his crime and his stinginess. You are the man said Nathan. And here's what God, the God of Israel, has to say to you. I made you king over Israel. I freed you from the fist of Saul. I gave you your master's daughter and other wives to have and to hold. I gave you both Israel and Judah. And if that hadn't been enough, I'd have gladly thrown in much more. So why have you treated the word of God with brazen contempt, doing this great evil? You murdered Uriah the Hittite, took his wife as your wife. Worse, you killed him with an Ammonite sword. And now, because you treated God with such contempt, and took Uriah the Hittite's wife as your wife, killing and murder will continually plague your family. This is God speaking, remember? I'll make trouble for you out of your family. Then David confessed to Nathan, I've sinned against God. Nathan pronounced, yes, but that's not the last word. God forgives your sin. You won't die for it, but because of your blasphemous behavior, the son born to you will die. That's the reading for this day, which I admit is not much of an Advent reading as we usually think of it. But looking at it 
this year, I think it, it actually does fit well. The most amazing moment of this reading is when David is confronted with all he had done by a representative of the, of the community that has helped him become who he is. And when he listens to how another person sees him, he confesses, I've sinned against God. And from that day on, though David does indeed struggle with the consequences of his actions, right? His family will have strife, right? He does not, again, cut himself off from those who would help him stay honest and maintain his integrity. He does not cut himself off and stay home alone when it is time for the kings to go out to, to defend their kingdoms. The story of David is one worth pondering and reflecting on it is not a life that is perfect, right? It's not an example of what we should do. It is a story of a person, though, who is faithful, and when he falls, he is able to listen to others and to change. Noticing when he fails, though, that's the way, the, the part of this I want to look at, the part that matters to us. For he fails when he is apart from others. He fails when he is not doing what he is used to doing in being surrounded by people who care for him and will surround him with their expectations that he will be honorable and trustworthy, reminding him who he is and who he is capable of being. It's, and so over these last weeks of Advent, we've been looking at the nature of waiting which is at the core. The season of Advent is the time of waiting. And so we began Advent by acknowledging that we we're, we're in this very interesting moment. We are between Genesis and the creation of all that is good. Right? And we're heading towards Revelation and the kingdom to come, the redemption of all, all of creation. And we live in the middle, living our one life at a time as we're heading towards God's kingdom. And so then the next week after that, we took a look at Mary, who waits, and we looked at the patience of a mother who has to wait. For Mary has a child, knowing that the world into which this child is born is broken. And knowing that her child will do something about it, but she also knows that it's going to be a while before her child can do anything. Her child has to do things like grow up, and that's, that's going to be a bit, right? That's going to take many years. And, and so we're heading towards the kingdom, and we're heading towards the kingdom, hopefully, with the patience of a mother who knows that it's going to take a while to raise this child. It's going to take a while for us to get some traction on where we're going. And then last week, we looked at Peter and Paul and about how they wait, right? Peter and Paul, they both agreed upon, upon where they were going, and then they further agreed that they could go about the, what they were doing differently. Like, they could wait together, seeking God's will, and they could be peaceful with each other even when they disagreed about some of the details of how to approach that. All right, and so we've been looking at waiting, like knowing where we're going, waiting with the patience of a mother, waiting knowing that there is plenty of Jesus to go around. I don't have to force you to do things the way that I do things. As long as we're waiting for Jesus together, that is good, right? And with David, he becomes the example of the importance of waiting together. We need to wait Together, For when it is, it is when we are disconnected and alone and apart from each other that we are most at risk at doing something that we simply should not do. Not, and with David, it's not because he wants to cause a problem, but there is no one there to tell him that what he is doing is ugly and that this really is not a good idea. In him, we see something that is in all of us. We all have a de an ability towards self-deception that is truly amazing at times, right? We need each other to help us and to remind us to tell the truth about each other, about who we are, who we are called to be as we follow Jesus, and to help us see that uh, we are capable of self-deception. Saying, oh yeah, that'll be fine, when really, it's not. It strikes me that looking at David, who was alone in his capital, that we are in a similar situation. Y'all are watching this. We are scattered. Like, I'm preaching this to a camera, and, and I'm, in, I'm, this, I'm in this sanctuary alone. 
I don't know if I've ever felt more disconnected than I do right now in this season. And maybe you're struggling with that as well. And so while we're alone, I, I, I don't expect anyone watching this to uh, do what David did, to abuse their powers as the head of state, because I don't think anyone who's a head of state is going to be watching this video. Let me know if I'm wrong about that. But uh, there are times when we are isolated, and this, this is a time when we are isolated and distant and it is a time that we have to choose, consciously choose and follow through on staying connected to each other. Because we need each other. And I hope that you are doing what you can to call and connect and to sustain us as a community that follows Jesus and follows Jesus together. Whether it be phone calls, letters, uh, Zoom, uh, whatever it is that works. If you are struggling in these days, also please let me know. Please, please call me. Let me know. And, and just we, we need to be able to lean on each other, especially right now when it is so very hard, uh, when, we are, when we're feeling so disconnected. To check back in with David, what Nathan tells him will happen does. And the infant child dies, and his family descends into conflict, and this conflict causes great pain, and the, the question of succession becomes quite complicated. And um, there are consequences for what David has done. Yet, in God, the worst thing is never the last thing. And even though David's child dies in that moment, and even though there is weeping over that lost child, that lost son of David, there is another child that will come. And from David's point of view, like David is waiting because David knows he has received the promise that God will work through his, him and his line, and, and he knows that there will be a Messiah that will come. And he's waiting for that Messiah, and, and he doesn't know much about it. We do, thankfully. Right. We know that there is another son of David. It takes many generations before we get to him, but we know his name, too. It is the son whose birth we are celebrating this season. We're, we're talking, of course, about the son of David, uh, Jesus, the Messiah. So thankfully we know about Jesus, his life, death, and resurrection. And now we do something that is, again, similar to David. In the same way that David was waiting for the son of David that was to come, the Messiah, to, to come at all, to come the first time, we find ourselves waiting for Jesus to return, to come a second time. I am deeply thankful that I do not wait for Jesus to return alone. I am deeply thankful that we have the church, that we do not wait alone, but we wait together, leaning on each other, trusting each other, reminding each other of the people we are capable of being by the grace of God, and by the, the grace of God and by knowing how much we can lean on each other and help each other become uh, the disciples of Jesus that we are called to be. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, even distant from each other, help us to continue to be bound together as your people, your church. Help us to wait faithfully, reminding and being reminded of your call upon our lives. In these coming days when families usually gather, please sustain those who must be alone. Protect those who must travel. And guide those who have to make decisions about what we do during these holidays. We pray for all these things in the name of your in your name. Amen. I hope to see you at some point on the 21st through a windshield or, or on the 24th in person. Uh, I, I hope you have a Merry Christmas and uh, I hope you are able to lean on some other people in whatever way is possible in these coming days as we wait for the birth of Jesus, the Son of God. Go forth now in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.